So our next panel is presented by our cultural institution, Cousins, the Art Gallery of Western Australia. This panel is entitled New Ways Forward, Disrupting Hierarchies in the Arts. In 2020, global issues such as the Black Lives Matter movement and the impact of COVID-19 on our social relationships have created worldwide change and provided the opportunity to shift the status quo. It's a critical moment where we can decide to create new spaces, shape a way forward that is diverse and inclusive, and step outside the traditional hierarchies found within the gallery and museum sector. This panel is going to take a moment to reflect on how we could do things differently to create more space, allow more voices, and develop arts experiences that engage people authentically, openly, and with continued relevance. Please welcome to the stage the panel and the moderator for this panel, Shaheen Hughes, who's going to introduce everybody. Shaheen is the inaugural CEO of the Museum of Freedom and Tolerance and is a passionate advocate for the pursuit of social justice and cultural equity outcomes throughout the arts. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, Welcome to this session. I hope you're all feeling good today. Um, I'd like to begin by welcoming our speakers today, um, a fantastic panel, Rowan Kickett, um, Jeremy Smith, welcome from Pika, Gemma Weston from Perth Festival, and of course, Ian Strange from Agua. It's great to be here on the stage with you for this important session. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we do meet on Wajak Noongar land and to pay my deep respect to elders past and present. So 2020, I think disruption, you will all agree, is a very apt theme. Um, it is a critical moment. I feel like many systems have, um, you know, been disrupted already and it provides us with an enormous, um, you know, opportunity to work together as arts institutions, as artists to change the way we see things. Um, so the question we've been given to ponder today is how can we as institutions and artists do things differently to create more space and allow more voices in our institutions? Um, I wanted to start today by, um, I guess, challenging the language and the notion that um, hierarchies found within the gallery and museum sector are traditional. I wanted to talk a bit about that word because traditional is a word sometimes prone to being sentimentalized. Um, these systems aren't traditional, these systems are colonial, um, they are artificial systems, inherently violent systems and structures of the settler colonial state built to concentrate power away from the owners of this land. I think they are not traditional to the people of this land and the multiplicity of traditions that have been born here and date back more than 60,000 years. So in terms of contextualising the discussion today, what we're clearly talking about is decolonisation. Um, so how do we reorient our art galleries and institutional spaces of culture towards a new decolonised framework to reflect our place here on Noongar Buja? So Rowan, um, I'd like to start with you, if I may, and get you to talk um, to this question. Yeah, um, as a Noongar artist, um, I've been practising for many years in Perth and I've also had own experiences within the uni system. Um, and that word colonial um, really resonates strong. And when we look at institutions in Perth, um, you look at the basis that they're founded on, it's academia. And when you look at what the basis of academia is founded on, it's a very colonial mindset. So when you were looking at a very institutionalised system built on a colonial mentality, which is a racially and uh, biased system, so when we look at the lack of representation of Noongar artists in Perth, particularly within these institutions, you can get an understanding of why there is a lack of representation because Aboriginal art really does not fit into this colonial system that has been built within these institutions. Um, particularly with the academia, we're getting these kids straight out of high school. They're very impressionable and then they're going through this system which is built on the colonial mentality. They're being indoctrinated into this system and they're not really thinking about the system and anything outside that system um, is obviously wrong because it's not what they've been taught. And these people are making the decisions in Perth now within the institutions. Um, and that right there, it's, they don't have any education when it comes to Aboriginal art. There isn't even an Aboriginal art unit at university. There's no Aboriginal art degree. Um, so we're having a lot of people making decisions about our industry that actually have no education when it comes to Aboriginal art, what it is or where it comes from. 
and the ramifications of this is our artists don't get the opportunity to show their work in its entirety. We're forced into a very commercialised sector um, in the public work sector where as soon as you start over commercialising things, you start to lose the integrity of what you're doing. And that's one thing I'm very worried about is the integrity of our stories and our culture that's been shown in Perth. Is it really with the public works? There's so much criteria you have to meet. And um, at the end of the day, is it really the artwork and are they really expressing the full cultural story in its entirety? Which if they did this within the institutions, they have that freedom of expression to really show that cultural aspect and to really tell it to, a, to the full degree and keep that integrity strong. So, Rowan, I'm interested, um, you know, these are very broken and unsafe foundations, um, the museum sector, the educational institutions. Um, do we need to start again? And this is a question I'll throw out to all of you as well. Um, can colonial institutions de decolonise themselves or do we need to start again? Would you like to start and then we'll go around the panel? Yeah, when I look at the system, um, why would you want to rebuild that? Um, why, why not start again? If we start again, we have an opportunity to build something extremely unique and unique to Perth. And if we do that, we can actually create a real Perth identity with that. And I think that's such a, a good concept to have that identity with on the world stage from Perth as something being extremely unique. Hi. Um, yeah, look, I am here today representing Pika, um, the red brick building over the, the courtyard there. Um, we're 30 years old. Uh, we were started as an artist run initiative. So I guess that's interesting context when discussing constitutions and uh, sorry, when discussing institutions in about how the starting point was was begun, I guess. And so there was a group of artists that led to the creation of Pika from an organisation or an artist run collective called Praxis. Um, and look, Pika in recent years has been taking slow but purposeful steps towards improving the way that we are open, are accessible, um, uh, and I think something that I was going to talk about quite extensively today was about being an ally um, to first people, to disabled people, to people of colour and whatnot as well. So, And that's something that I guess me as general manager is really keen to work on within our organisation about how all of our staff can become allies and, and create better senses of empathy and understanding to do that change from within. And I guess we're noticing as well that a lot of artists that we work with are starting to be very um, direct in the way that they want us to change, respond, react as well. Um, so that's one thing we started with very purposefully with programming and the types of works that we're presenting within Pika. We're a multi-art form organisation, so we do have a presenter program of visual arts of performance and then also um, have works in development in our space as well, which is something that's quite different and unique for, for I guess, the representatives here today on, on this panel. And how all of those steps create a better, safer, more meaningful environment for staff as well as um, our audiences as well as the artists as well as the stakeholders that we work with is something that we're um, we're on a journey I guess at the moment I don't think we're at a finishing point and we're nowhere near that finishing point but it's very something that we're very cognizant of and um, and trying to change from within um, we've made good progress on a board level um, and I guess staff is the the next piece of work that we're looking at as well Gemma Hi, uh, so I'm I'm here from Perth Festival today, but pr uh, prior to my role at, first, at Perth Festival, I worked at Lawrence Wilson Art Gallery on campus at UWA for about six years. And so something that I'm well and truly <laughs> institutionalised and um, uh, something that I've been reflecting on this year is the, uh, the the transition of, I suppose, speed and pace between those two, those two institutions. I think for uh, a festival has really highlighted for me the, um, the difficulty in uh, I suppose thinking slowly and carefully within a framework that really requires quite high pressure environments that requires uh, short term contracts and uh, a high degree of sort of staff uh, staff turnover, just in the in the in the structure of the um, of, of delivering uh, a festival. So when when all of your work is contra is concentrated in a particular 
point of the year and how those um, those conditions often create barriers for, for entry for people from, um, from from diverse backgrounds there's a ten there tends to be a reliance on the known on on the on the on the proven um, and uh, and so the festival is also as uh, as Pika is involved in a really active process of really having having this conversation inside that organization and something that I was really really proud of is that the responding quite quickly to that was that the um, was we have an appointment, we have a, a specific position uh, appointed for community engagement, and then our HR uh, um, HR manager Jess Blackwell advertised for a series of paid traineeships, acknowledging that payment and support is a really important part of that of that process, and something that often, as volunteers, as part time staff, as people working in precarious uh, um, employment conditions, can be could be difficult to kind of create that that safe that safe space. So those were advertised for um, people of, of, of uh, culturally and linguistically diverse background, uh, pe uh, people, uh, First Nations um, people, and um, people identifying with a disability. And we had, as we had, so there, we were, it was intended that we would appoint two candidates, but there were, there were so many exceptional applications. We've actually brought five people on board, and then uh, Jess is working as well to educate start, uh, um, the team to create a safe environment for those people and to maintain relationships with them. So it's not a it's not a quick fix, and it's something that it is. It's a really long term, slow process, but those are things that. I, I think can really actively change the the work culture in in the long term, and so I believe that reform is necessary, and I also believe that new spaces are possible alongside that. That we do need to diversify the kinds of uh, cultural institutions and add more um, add more frameworks alongside reforming what we already already have. Ian, do you want to add to that? Hi, um, so my name's uh, Ian Strange, and uh, I'm here today on behalf of the Art Gallery of Western Australia. Um, I think it's probably good to give context of, of my role there and, and the journey the gallery's uh, currently going on. So uh, in the last, I think, last six months, uh, Colin Walker was appointed as the new director uh, and one of his first decisions was to bring on myself in the role of uh, guest artistic director, um, which is a new role and I, I believe a role that hasn't happened inside an Australian institution uh, like this before. Um, and I guess the the intention is to almost have a bit of a, a reset and to think about where the organisation can go and, and setting a, a sort of new creative direction. Like personally for me, um, I've never worked inside uh, an organisation before. My background is as a uh, visual artist uh, practising for the last 15 years and that's sort of been between here in Australia and through the US as well, uh, as well as working with, with lots of... Uh, most of my uh, art projects have involved working with large community groups and in consultation with, with communities and teams of people. So it really has been uh, a very sort of collaborative, uh, a collaborative, I wouldn't say sh social practice, but bordering on a social practice um, uh, working within communities. So it's been very interesting for me uh, for the first time coming into an organisation and also coming in uh, with the perspective of uh, an artist. Um, and I think that for me, a lot of these questions um, are coming up really interesting. I think we've had a, a pre-panel we're talking about. A lot of things have been really uh, constructive for the journey that the gallery is actually on at the moment about asking these big questions about where the, where, uh, where the role of the gallery is in uh, elevating uh, voices that we haven't had before, where we work with our collection as well, and where we work with our curators. Um, myself, I'm quite biased. I, I really think that um, artists are, are world leaders in, in all conversations, in all spaces as well, and I think we would do very well by letting, um, being a space that can let uh, artists speak through us as an organisation and let artists take the lead in a lot of these things as well. So a lot of my agenda is making sure that um, all artists' voices can come in and a lot of these conversations can be led by artists or arts practices, um, particularly ones that are, uh, are, I think, more diverse practices that can actually move into spaces of uh, site-specific response to the organisation itself and the building itself, but also uh, institutional critique and, and, and practices that really do get in and interrogating organisations. And I think artists do an amazing job um, and there's so much power in letting artists come in and, and, and have those voices inside the organisation as well. So that's something that we're um, really interested in having and I'm also very excited about this conversation today and how that will inform the directions of the gallery going forward. 
Yeah, that's great. And Anne, I think your role is really interesting in being, you know, both an artist and um, someone now working within the context of an institution and to recognise there is an inherent tension between an arts maker and someone who, you know, engages in arts practice and an institution. And um, not all tension is bad. That's something we discussed earlier this week. You know, we do need um, civic institutions to be safe spaces, but that doesn't mean there isn't going to be tension. You know, these are big slow question do you want to say something yeah I, I mean I think something that's really interesting about that statement is the notion of an, an organization commissioning its own institutional critique and I wonder where I, I think there's um, it's it's which I think is, is really really powerful and opening a, an organization up to, to vulnerability but I wonder whether that uh, process also needs to be uh, mediated by a, um, a voices from, I suppose, outside the institution or outside of that that invitational structure, I, I suppose, in order to be meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more. Actually, I think the uh, the process of commissioning artists, particularly, I mean, the interesting thing for me is coming in, being someone as an artist who's worked outside an organisation and coming in and seeing these processes firsthand and realizing, um, I guess, how much they haven't really caught up necessarily with how artists work, and they've seen them in quite a singular way. Um, and I really, I, I do strongly believe that those processes of bringing those voices in, it really, it shouldn't necessarily be the job of the gallery to decide who that is and it should be about, I think the power of critique is about it actually coming from those outside voices and actually, and how those voices are bringing that decision making process is something that needs to be addressed inside the gallery as well and what that commissioning process is as well, yeah. I think we spend so much time focusing on who is in the room and it's we don't pause and sort of take stock of who isn't in the room and ask those questions and actually point stuff out in that sense. So I think that's something that um, is a question that we should be sort of, we, we're so often so self-congratulatory about, oh great, we've got a First Nations person, we've got a disabled person or whatever, but then who else should be in the room as well to, as part of these conversations and a part, as part of these decision-making structures too. Rowan, who else should be in the room? Um, yeah, I can completely agree with um, what they're saying. It's um, people who are outside of the system. If they want to change the system um, to better different demographics and different races, they need to have those voices of those demographics and races within the dem um, decision making. Um, to have those voices outside the system, you're actually going to get some sort of difference within what's being shown because they are outside the box. When you get the decision makers all from within the system, you end up with very similar artworks consistently being shown by the same demographic of people. And that's the thing too, you can't just generalise representation in the sense that I'm a disabled man, um, I have a chondroplasia, but I would not dare try to speak on behalf of someone that is neurodiverse or a First Nations Australian or a person of colour. You can't just wrap all of that up in to say that um, we've got that voice in the room, so that's great. So my experience is my experience. Um, yes, that gives me things like empathy, and as I said before, that makes me a good ally, but I don't think that you can sort of then um, do a tick and flick when it comes to consultation in terms of saying, oh, we had a disabled person in the room or we had a First Nations person in the room. I'm sure Rowan wouldn't sort of dare speak on behalf of all First Nations culture as well. Yeah, we have, um, like, a lot of elders get the become the decision makers and a lot of our elders don't have a arts background um, they know about culture but they don't know about our art history they don't know about our art movements within our art history um, and they're making decisions are based on on cultural knowledge not art knowledge and to me it's it is quite um, it does hurt our industry as well because we're getting decision makers again from people who don't really know and don't have an arts background within our own um, industry and I think I think that challenge, Rowan, really speaks to the necessity of time, and the and really evaluating the timelines for for consultation because you do you know you do con you need to consult widely. You need to speak to to you know there's there's just um, it's yeah that's it <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting because a lot of what we're talking about, it, you know, and, and the purpose of the decolonisation process is to broaden the box. You know, we keep talking about who has to be in the box because the box is quite small and quite privileged. And we've crowded. Uh, yeah, well, it's, does, does it have to be a box? Does it, you know, do, they ha do there have to be walls? How do you classify who's in and who's out? Because, you know, it's back to this issue of neutrality, like, when you curate something as an institution serving the public good, there are decisions that sort of have to be made. Um, um, and what Jeva said, it's going to be a time thing. Um, when you, we can make changes for them now by giving positions to 
these um, First Nations people and people with dis disabilities to make those decisions now, um, but also it's going to be a generational change from the grassroots. And if we can have uh, an actual Aboriginal art specific degree, then we can have Aboriginal artists in the field with an education and they can make those informed decisions. Um, so that's going to be a long-term effect, which we need to start ASAP. Otherwise, it's just going to be put off and put off and that generational gap is going to be two generations, um, which we need to start as soon as we can. And I guess, yeah, sorry. Oh, no, I, I just leading on from that, something we're talking a lot about at the gallery as well is um, broadly within Western Australia, within the, um, within the arts community here, there isn't really the strength of uh, commercial galleries or gallery pipeline for artists as well. So really, as an organisation, what we're talking about is what is our responsibility generationally to artists. So a museum traditionally in a city would start working with, I guess, artists, more established artists, people mid to late career start collecting at that point. But as an organisation, if we're looking at an ecosystem where we want living, working artists with a long career, how are we investing in people early on and how are we building practices, but then also how are we creating space for diverse practices as well and diverse perspectives so people can see themselves in those institutions and space for those practices that maybe don't exist right now as well. Well, I think, and that, I think that comes back to what Rowan was saying about education, where uh, I think it's also looking at where, what the pathway is to becoming a, a, a professional artist and whether that is necessarily best represented by uh, a degree in the, in the tertiary system, a master's degree, a PhD, uh, the kind of the, the, or the, or the pathway even through uh, traditional commercial commercial gallery uh, network if those structures don't necessarily support and represent a diversity of, of perspectives then I think there needs to be sort of some flexibility and some um, generosity on the part of institutions in understanding how different people come to artistic practice. Yep. And there's an incredibly low take up if you, I mean, and if we look at all the problems associated with funding for arts education and particularly the humanities at the moment and the disproportionately low take up or ability for artists from diverse and First Nations background to inhabit that space, you know, art institutions are still traditionally very privileged spaces. Um, and, you know, it's a very competitive industry partly because everyone's looking for the same funding. Um, does anyone want to, you know, comment on how we can disrupt, you know, make disruptions earlier in that pipeline? Um, I mean, I've spent four years most recently working in at the Australia Council uh, for the Arts in, in Sydney and um, I was the Director of Community Art and Experimental Art, so two very diverse and different portfolios. And I guess something over that four years um, that we looked at through our grants model was about, again, who was in the room making the decisions because a lot of the grants programs that I was related with were peer assessed. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that when we started that journey, there was efforts to make sure that at least there was one First Nation peer in the room or one disabled peer or one voice from regional Australia. But that becomes a very unsafe experience for those particular people because I think the rest of the room falls silent when it's um, time to talk about issues of First Nations art practice or regional Australia arts practice or, or disabled arts practice. And the labour on that individual is very um, um, heavy, I guess, to sort of be the spokesperson and the decision maker. But that's something that collectively we should all feel the safety to speak up about. Um, and then obviously in those sorts of in, in situations where there is key decisions being made, try and not make it just reliant on one person. So I always endeavoured to at least get two First Nation peers in the room or two people from regional Australia so that there were that multiplicity of voices. And quite often the dynamic was really amazing because there was confliction of views between those two peers in instances as well. So um, it makes for a richer, robust discussion, I think, in those types of settings and frameworks. Um, and it was, you know, council does have a, a siloed approach in the sense it does have an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Arts panel, but more and more we're seeing a stronger success rate for First Nations artists in the non-identified um, uh, grant programs, if that makes sense, which is really exciting, I think, too. And in, I mean, in in my organisation, each genre area essentially has one person. So I'm the visual arts program associate. We have a, a film program associate, a literature and ideas curator. But then, what's really Im important um, to sort of de-silo some of that is that we're uh, also looking at uh, different advisory bodies. Uh, so having an access advisory body, a our advisory circle, um, a, um, a youth advisory circle that really feeds back into the, the programming team. So even when the organisational structure doesn't 
necessarily allow through you know cash flow that's that's a, that's a big it's a big thing um to the the employment although those those positions are also pa they're, they're paid they're remunerated as well those advisory positions which is really important that there is a, it's still a multiplicity of voices feeding back into that programming conversation through those bodies yeah oh, no, i guess to say in terms of the the journey of the galley that we're on at the moment as well as along with carly lane we're bringing in a uh, associate curator of Indigenous art as well to work alongside her as a as a, a first step to bring in uh, newer, different voices, I guess, into that space as well. Um, but as of obviously the, the beginning of a journey at the gallery. And do these steps resonate with you, Rowan? Is is this enough? What else should the institutions be doing? Um, there are institutions who are doing really wonderful things, and they've um, particularly like the Bunbury Regional Art Gallery has yeah. a really good community engagement program with the Noongar people and they're consistently showing different Aboriginal exhibitions and the reach they have is incredible. I was absolutely blown away when I went down there and, and I saw it firsthand. Um, there are a lot of good steps happening up here as well. The, a lot more progressive mindset behind AGWA. Um, I was at the, um, the meeting the other day um, with the strategic plan for the next five years and it was very inclusive and very, I was quite impressed with that as well. Um, but I mean, we can only do so much in that space in the time in that time frame these these things that were are happening are very first steps that we can do um, but we really do need to hit right from the core with the education system and like uh, when i was at uni there was only two aboriginal artists at curtin uni that was me and my brother um, then i left and then another student came in so there's still only two um, so we really need to get those numbers up um, to really make that impact with the decision making with around our industry and that's the first steps towards autonomy over our own industry and to stop being dictated to and we can actually voice what it is but we want out of our industry, not what everybody else wants out of our industry. And I, I think that's really important, you know, just that multiplicity of voices to be somehow incorporated into it incorporated into a system that is really only designed for one voice or the idea of you know in that western canon of art history and you know collection it's having the dominant voices that make informed decisions on behalf of everybody else you know I, I imagine that must be quite challenging at some point you know to just open the doors to multiplicity um you know we we multiplicity can can you know to play devil's advocate lead to some of the division we're seeing in the world today and i guess you know that's the challenge of institutions to be safe spaces we talk about safety a lot and i'd like to come back to that too but you know how you design um these you know prototype these environments where multiple voices can feel safe like I feel that the world today could really learn from the art sector if we get that right yeah a bit of a passion project for me at the moment is to to is thinking about the the language that galleries speak in um that uh, which I think comes from comes from the academy because that's often the source of a lot of curatorial and and and, and arts um staff uh, arts artists uh, at the moment and um just i had this experience on working in the festival last year with uh tony sarah and maima a, a wider who are a collaborative duo and they tony's a, a blind filmmaker and he has a project to integrate audio description into the production of film rather than it being a kind of overlay on on the top and we were talking about his gallery experience he was like i just don't bother with the panels because they don't tell me anything about what's there like, which is, I think, like, just a huge, I mean, for me also to, to experience that as a revelation of, like, of course you would need to describe the, the, the thing. We didn't do audio description today, which I was sort of thinking yeah, about. Yeah, and, and that, because the, I, I think that's a, it was a demonstration to me of how how divorced the language of speaking about art had become from, I suppose, the embodied experience of, of art and that's that access point is is so is so important is that the consideration of the the language in which the institution speaks or allows to to speak in those in in those spaces just practically like blurbs exhibit essays like all of all of that stuff i think a lot of that's about stigma as well i think um yesterday uh, well sorry earlier this week i used this session as a opportunity to bring the staff at Peaker together over lunch and have a conversation and we had a very broad ranging discussion with everyone and one of the things is that I think people come into, you know, for goodness sakes we're a contemporary arts organisation, I don't get a lot of what we do at most times but um, <laughs> so there is a certain stigma around that as well and I think people's ability to feel free and confident and welcome to speak and voice an opinion um, and then for that institution to be 
open to receiving that and acting on it is something that's, I think, really um, um, important as well. And I think the whole concept of failure is something that people really fear, and I think failure is a good thing in most circumstances, provided you learn from it and don't do it again. I think, I think definitely... <laughs> I definitely think um, <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, I definitely think uh, Agra has been very guilty of, of of that and that sort of reiterating that kind of very singular idea of what art is and experience of art is as well in its language and also um, I know we, we sort of talked about the distinguishing the institution the idea of institutional ideas and a building but that particular brutalist building and the experience of walking into that space and how that architecture affects and, and codes the rest of your experiences moving through that building. Um, while it's an incredibly beautiful building, there needs to be a lot of work done in changing the experience of walking in there and moving through that. And that has, um, I think, perpetuated a lot of the, um, uh, uh, I think a lot of people's worst fears about the art world, that it is this elitist place with obtuse language that's designed for a single set of people or a, a privileged people who have access to information to be able to understand it as well. And I think there's a lot of work that the gallery can be doing to actually make that experience um, for all people who want to engage with art or just um, softening the experience with art and understanding that it can be for absolutely everyone. And I think there's um, certainly that, that that gallery has not necessarily been helped by uh, that monolith of a building as well um, in the past. Um, yeah, growing up, um, going to these institutions, um, I grew up predominantly looking at Aboriginal art and Noongar art that my uncles had done, and um, it took me ages to get a concept of what Western art actually was. Um, and going into the institutions, I just I had no idea what I was looking at. Um, even reading it, I couldn't understand half the words. <laughs> uh, it wasn't until I was very uh, older I could actually grasp what's actually behind it and what they're trying to say within the work. And um, Within myself, I had to physically go out and listen to artist talks to try and grasp what it is, um, the Western art system and how it works. And uh, I actually remember the very first body of work that resonated me, with me as an artist, and it was about burnouts. <laughs> and that's from the demographic that I come from. <laughs> um, and that opened up a massive world. Once that resonated with me, um, that's when I started to search deeper and I wanted to learn more and understand more. Um, but not everybody has that opportunity and, and understanding of what's being hung on the walls. And um, that's why we really need to have a different diverse range within the gallery, for something for everybody. Um, so then kids can go in there and go, oh, that's really cool. And then they can be inspired to create something themselves. Um, the burnout series that I uh, saw and resonated with me has inspired me in so many different ways. And my ability to create art as an artist and open a whole new world um, creatively. Yeah, and I think we forget the you know fundamental purpose of and beauty of art is to for it to resonate with you really deeply. And I feel like sometimes I mean, you know, walking into the art gallery can be a really terrifying experience. And you know, it is. It's about you know the color of the walls, and it's you know whether you see yourself in the paintings. Because even in your existing collections, without even bringing the sort of new collections in, the you know people on the walls are quite white. They don't look like you know, the people who might want to walk in off the street. Um, the gift shop might be very expensive. You know, the um, cafe might not serve food. People really sort of fancy eating. And I, I don't think that's just about diverse populations um, experiencing that lack of safety. I think lots of people want to be able to interact more with art and we've got all these rules that like can't touch something or, you know, this is barricaded off and there's all these kind of, you know, security guards are walking around and I think kind of you know decoding lots of those experiences across museums and galleries like we talk to um, young people in the communities we work with all the time at um, MFT and you know you say we have to explain why we call ourselves a museum of freedom and tolerance because they go well we don't actually like muse museums we don't feel safe in museums and you know there's an equity um, point of view to consider the public resourcing that goes into upholding a very specific western canon of art and a way of seeing art that you know might be good to challenge for all of us because art can be fun and inspiring and there was um, a great um, piece circulated um, in our discussions um, 
some research conducted in America recently that, you know, a lot of visitors actually just want to have more fun when they go into an arts institution. And I think just, you know, cracking some of those barriers would be really good. Um, you know, I'll move on, if I may, and ask you a question about, so there's been a huge debate in the sort of traditional museum world recently. Um, ICOM, the museum body, uh, trying, I guess, because lots of museums and civic spaces around the world are trying to move towards a more social justice oriented function um, to create a new definition that was less, you know, about this kind of, you know, very elite view of art. And I'm going to read it out. Um, it hasn't been successful um, currently, and I'd be interested in your views, sort of why and, and what we can do to make these sort of definitions more successful. So the new definition, it, probably also because it's quite long, um, museums are democratising inclusive and polyphonic spaces for critical dialogue about the pasts and the futures. They are participatory and transparent and work in active partnership with and for diverse communities to collect preserve, research, interpret, exhibit and enhance understandings of the world, aiming to contribute to human dignity and social justice, global equality and planetary well-being. Um, how do you feel about that, you know, from an artistic and an institutional concept? Should museums try and be all those things? Well, I wonder if it failed because it meant, or it meant the museums had to acknowledge that they weren't that, those those things. That it was so that it was really divorced from the the the, the practice of of being human. <laughs> um, I mean, I sort of you know, uh, it's uh, <laughs> the four years that I spent in the Australia Council, I used to see all these artists contorting themselves to fit guidelines and criteria to sort of become an organisation to get more funding and all that sort of stuff. And then even the process of becoming an organisation is so colonial because you have to get a, you know, strategic plan and a mission statement and values and all that sort of thing. And and why do we even need definitions is my sort of thing. I mean, that in itself just really um, still um, has the propensity to other because you're labelling all those things and there are things that aren't included in that. So what about those people that are left out of that definition or those parts of society and everything like that? You know, uh, one of the most beautiful things that I sort of adopted early on um, in my practice as a community arts practitioner was nothing about us without us. And I think that is just sort of the, the thing that a lot of um, institutions, organisations, actions need to just be sort of very cognizant and wary of. I, I just want to briefly also, as somebody who worked for a as a collections curator for, curator for a long time, just just have a little moment to advocate on the the benefit for of, of public collections. Though I think that 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 with the right with 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 an intent that's more towards custodianship rather than ownership, or depending on the on, on you know the frameworks that's surrounded, those are those are public assets, and those are those are things that tell the story of our of our of our commu of our community, um, and the bureaucracies that that surround them as cultural assets are are also important structures, I think as long as they're used for the purposes of accountability and transparency and that the the in, in, intent in their creation is, I suppose, um, noble rather than I exclusionary. I just, yeah, just want to brief moment for collection for collections. <laughs> and I, I mean, it's been interesting at Agwell because we've been rewriting the, uh, the collections policy when the process of doing that. And something that I found surprising coming in is is literally within our, our mandate is is to maintain and show the collection and to look after the buildings and that's it and then everything we do after that is our choice anything beyond that and so that was really a revelation for me as an organization that the two things we just have to maintain is collection and and these these set of buildings as well at, as a government mandate so that actually gives us a lot of freedom of movement as an organization of where we go where we choose to put our focus and all those things as well and also con controlling where the collection goes in the future too and that's the thing, I think people are so obsessed on stuffing more things into their, um, you know, constitution or stat deck or whatever, whereas if you just keep it away and then opt in to do all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. that's when real change starts to happen. Uh, yeah, you can change paperwork, but you can't change culture that quickly. And you can change definitions, um, it's still not going to change culture. My high school had a bad rep, they changed the name, it's still got a bad rep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can't. Um, culture is something so much harder to change than just paperwork. Um, you can have the paperwork there, but it, it will take a long time and it, it is from the people within the organisations that has to change. 
And I think the exciting thing about the here and now and whether it has been, you know, this very disruptive year of 2020 giving us all more opportunity, but I do feel there are more conversations across the institutional and non-institutional space, such as we have practiced this week that, and we've reflected on the fact that this is a long and difficult journey. And sort of coming back to safety, you know, we talk a lot in our communities about the need for safety in these institutions that feel quite unsafe, but I think, Gemma, it's important to recognise the, the function um, and the need of museums and galleries and also that you know when you look at the polling when you do poll museum visitors quite a number do want their museums and galleries to be very safe and very neutral and very non-political and during the Black Lives Matter movement there were institutions that really kind of pursued the call and opened themselves up and there are institutions that you know decided to be more traditional because that made people feel safe as well and I think it's really important to acknowledge in this conversation that it's not um, winning at any expense you know I don't think diversity um, should uh, it's sometimes seen as a bit of a zero-sum game that you know we expect galleries and institutions to sort of seed space um, and change practices and we definitely do but I think it's because the pie has an ability to grow larger as well you know how do you as institutions kind of maintain that balance between being you know neutral spaces as you said according to your remit and you know is it just an opt-in approach you know how do you satisfy your it's a pretty difficult job to satisfy that many visitors right I mean, it's a really good question um, and something that we, we're struggling with and talking about a lot. Um, my Everything I will always come back to is the artists and I think that artists are still leaders in these conversations and we as an organisation can um, allow artists to present those perspectives through the organisation in different channels and that doesn't necessarily mean on the walls of the gallery. It can be through lots of different ways of working with artists inside, behind the scenes in organisation and inside the gallery and through different channels that we work on as well. So that's that's the thrust and the direction that I'm, 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 I've sort of really considered the way of accessing those stories without actually being seen as an organisation necessarily um, uh, making people feel uncomfortable so it's showing the perspective of these artists and all these different practitioners through the organization i think that i think i mean i mean i think the question of neutrality is i don't i don't know what i don't know what nothing is neutral like nothing what is is there anything in the world that is neutral um and i, I mean I, I certainly certainly galleries and museums aren't um, because they fundamentally re re reflect their, their, their governance and, and the choices that the organisation makes to um, interpret their, 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 their kind of, um, their, their remit. Um, I had a second point, but I've forgotten it. I'll come back. I mean, I, uh, uh, Pika doesn't know this yet. Um. <laughs> I've got some colleagues in the room. Surprise! Um, no, no, no. I sort of like I, I sort of come into um, a, an approach of the four A's that I always use. So I acknowledge that I'm a person of, of, of whiteness and a person of privilege and a person um, who has certain aspects of power. Um, I do what I can to um, be a good ally for people and and how I can change others in our organisation to be an ally to do with me. Um, I try to encourage agency for our artists, our audiences and our stakeholders to speak up and call stuff out. And then I also um, like to sort of encourage others to be an accomplice as well. So they're the three four <laughs> A's that I um, try to sort of do. And I hope change organisations from within as well through little truth bombs and stuff like that. I think we were, we were talking about breaking down, like breaking down the indi the individuality of things, and 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 speaking more for the collective. But I also think there's something really useful to do is in in acknowledging the specific the specificity of your in, your your individual perspective in any in any work you do. That that's fundamental. That's fundamental to kind of building those 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 um, coalitions, I suppose. Yeah, and um, um, there's some lovely pieces of work out there that we discussed. The um, sort of you know did, took some deep breaths around the other day. Um, that you know decolonization isn't always this hard space that you know takes us on this uncomfortable journey, although it is. But there's some really beautiful practices that we can adopt as institutions, as artists in the world in general, around you know how we decolonize this idea of you know progress and budgets and pressure and you know 
this need for constant measurement that's, you know, making everyone exhausted. Structures. I think even, I mean, it, we had a pre-panel sort of discussion about this and even, and I think I'd run in from somewhere and, was like, <laughs> and had like some hectic energy going on and then even like Lily just started the, the, the session by saying, well, how's everyone going today? And then just having, and then so we started with a conversation about what was happening in our lives and how we were feeling, which really sort of set the, to rather than kind of, rather than rushing into a sort of an adversarial or a, not, not necessarily adversarial, but I mean, it just, that tiny thing made such, it makes such a difference to the, to the, to the kind of tone of the discussion. It's again, time and space yeah. making it, yeah. And I mean, our institutions provide an amazing opportunity for time and space, you know, and once you get used to that, you know, and understand what the space can be. They are such a public good that we need to protect and, you know, fund and keep at all costs because they're little sanctuaries from the world where we can demonstrate these really beautiful listening practices. And, you know, sometimes listening isn't, you know, factored enough into, you know, we go into galleries to look and what we need to do is listen and listen, I think, you know, to each other a lot more and also learn to think critically. Like one of the provocations that, you know, we kind of need to wrap up and go to questions, but that, you know, we wanted to put to you as an audience is, um, you know, you're all audiences, spectators, visitors to art galleries. Um, uh, Alice Proctor, who's an um, amazing kind of, you know, art historian who talks a lot about decolonisation, who visited Perth a couple of years ago and had some thoughts on, you know, the art gallery and what should be done but you know she talks about museums being choruses rather than solos but that's just not us as artists and the people that work in them it's also the people that walk in the doors because when you walk in the doors of a museum or an art gallery you can ask questions um you can say you know you can decide what to see and you can decide what not to see you can um you know stand and take deep breaths you can walk around you can be upset um, you can sit down and always, always, I think, go in and not expect the curator to have, you know, because it isn't neutral. You have to recognise you're not walking into a neutral space. You're walking into a space where other people have made decisions. So, um, you know, Rowan, where's, where's your work? You know, go in and ask and actually challenge the institutions and say, well, I don't see this work. Where is it? Um, you know, I what's this white space about? Why are these three works put together? Um, what is neutrality? Am I accepting, um, you know, an exhibition room full of white, you know, colonial people? Um, am I accepting this as normal? Because when you ask those questions, you're challenging the institution. You will also then ask them out on the street and you start to unpick, um, and that's, I guess, what decolonisation is about, you know, unpick um, that idea of what is normal and neutral and shown and valued. Rowan, do you want to talk a bit more to that before we go to questions? Uh, yeah, it's just about diversity, really. Um, decolonising is just getting rid of that that mentality of that and that culture of something being... Um, superior than any any other form and I always struggled with the idea of art and academia and how do you combine the two because art is such a free expressive um, thing that how can you actually sit down and study it in an academic way and that's something I always struggled with um, and to say that you know art is supposed to be done this way um, that is colonizing to other artists you either uh, assimilate to the system or you don't um, get shown um, but yeah, to decolonise, just get rid of that colonial mentality and just become more diverse and have a more array of different artists and the pie will grow bigger, um, much bigger. Do you guys want to talk about some sort of, you know, asp uh, we have talked about aspirational strategies, but, you know, things you've been, programs, projects you've been involved in, and then we will go to questions. I'm sorry, I've just asked another question, I realise, but... Um, I guess just to end on a positive note of, you know, in your career, some of the things that you've worked on that have really opened up these spaces and, you know, made the world a bit more generous as a result. Um, I, can, I can talk about a few of the things that are happening at the gallery coming up as well. I think uh, uh, Carly Lane uh, is opening up our G2 gallery, which is one of the biggest galleries we have and on the first floor, which would be... Uh, showing works directly from our Indigenous collection, which haven't been seen for a really long time, which is fantastic, uh, as well as finding more spaces through the gallery for that. Uh, will be the new rooftop, uh, which is opening in February. We'll have a 25-metre Christopher Peace work up there, light work that will be visible uh, from nearly all around the city as well, particularly looking at responding to the river and 
uh, is an incredibly significant commission as well up there. So those are those are two uh, steps in the journey for the gallery as well, but uh, ones that I'm particularly excited about. Oh, I mean, I spoke about I spoke about a few things, so I'm I'm just I'm I'm fine. Okay, I guess. Good. That's good. <laughs> um, I've actually got something that um, I was going to raise, which will be in our segue to questions, if that's okay. Yes. Um, I've spoken a few times. Um, there was a group of Australians that used to go on um, delegations to IETM, which is a contemporary performance network in Europe. And something that we started doing at those forums when we'd done a panel presentation, um, and this is the segue moment, is that we'd ask everyone to look at who was in the room during the question and answer session and ask if it was really your turn to answer a question. And by saying that, we meant, you know, traditionally the question and answer time was dominated by white English-speaking people. Um, so if you've got your hand up asking a question, have a look around who else has got their hand up. And I'm saying this for today and for every other situation that you're going through, given the topic of what we're talking about. Um, can you make space to a person of colour? Can you make space to a disabled person? Can you make space to a First Nations Australian to ask their question before yours? Is it really your turn? Do you have the ability and the privilege to make space? So that's my segue to this Lovely. part of it. Yes. You had surprises and segues. So with that, um, we've got a few minutes um, for questions. Keep uh, what Jeremy's just said in mind. Um, there is someone with a roving mic, if you your hand over here if you'd like to put your hands up and also say um, which panelist you are directing the question to and if I can just say as well following on from Jeremy that and um, we've got sort of 10 minutes or so and if we can just ask questions rather than kind of you know this time with us later um, to talk uh, sort of you know more generally but if you can just ask quite a direct question that would be awesome. Yeah, uh, hi. Um, I want to answer, ask this question to the people from the institutions. So um, what is actually put in place to show art from the community that the artists are actually doing, not that fits the sort of colonial mould and mentality that they, they have, so it's actually a good representation of the community. But also if it goes sort of shines the benefactors in a bad light, will that also get shown? Because I don't see too much of that either. Um, and I think that's uh, an issue that, while policy may be in place, reality may be a different situation. So, Yeah, I mean, the question of where the money is coming from is a really important one. Um, and uh, I, um, I don't really know how to, how, how, how to answer that. Uh, I think, in, you know, it's, it's cr critique, of, critique of those structures is, is, is important. Um, I, in, just going back to your first uh, question, a structure and or, or a tool that I think is really important is the idea of an EOI, so a public call out, and then a consultation process that goes alongside that that call out. So you can not only kind of canvas your community; it's a great way of discovering who's working out there, and that's a that's a I think a really important thing that uh, organisations can do to 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 op to manage the the gatekeeping of of curating and also just to, is it, I mean it's such a great and it's such an incredible research tool as well is just to understand who's out there by opening up a call out for people to tell you about what they're what they're doing um the the question of corporate and private philan philanthropy is really complex and one that I don't entirely feel um that I can address in the time that we have um, that's a whole other session yeah, it's, yeah and a long one Look, I mean, Pika, I sort of like you. Um, we've got, um, as I sort of alluded to before, a bit of a um, trajectory from within Pika where we run a studio program, we offer creative development opportunities, and then there's obviously a, an exhibition program. And so, and again, each of those stages have various call out processes as well. So we try to democratize that. I guess in a certain degree, particularly the studio program as well. So um, there are entry points. And then I think, you know, getting our staff out to, um, gatherings and shows and, and whatnot as well and knowing who's coming up through I mean one of the great wellsprings is our Hatch National Graduate Show which we have um, uh, which offers the opportunity for just first year grads to be part of a, an incredible national survey of um, who's coming up through the sector as well and I think this year there was a really strong um, a representation of artists from different backgrounds which was really fantastic so yeah um, I, I, it's, it's a bit of a big question but um I guess traditionally, uh, as an art museum, it's the role of the curators to go out and 
and and find this find this work and be knowledge about their areas and, and knowledge about artists and um, I should advocate the the curators at Agway do a fantastic job and and do work very very hard to be out there in the communities and and understanding their sector and and bringing artists through the attention of a curatorial process inside the gallery as well. Um, but largely, um, the gallery has been limited by uh, the format and spaces that it can show work in as a as a building and a series of buildings there. And so, um, without going into too much of the future plans for the gallery, we're really thinking about ourselves more as a, a decentralised organisation that can work in digital spaces, uh, that can open up the back uh, the the back of the gallery, can open up uh, more of the uh, the. Uh, police courts as well, for spaces, the rooftop, um, as well as creating dedicated digital spaces of creating different kinds of collaborations with artists uh, in creation of work and making work and that process of how that work is commissioned uh, is something that we'll be working through inside an organisation uh, organization level to actually maybe take the pressure off the curators specifically for how that, how that works and how that commissioning process works and also how we can have artists involved at every stage of the gallery and every part of the gallery's processes as well. So there is that level of involvement in, uh, in what would be traditionally called programming or events or things like that because there actually are arts practices that sit within those spaces too. Um, so hopefully um, going forward that's something that um, can create uh, different kinds of arts practices and different kind of touch points with artists with the, old, with the gallery itself. Um, and, and really uh, a lot of what we're focusing on is really trying to um, make more room for Western Australian artists at the gallery as well at each stage of their career. And that's going to be a really big focus for us going forward that maybe the gallery hasn't had such a focus on. Um, uh, in terms of, of what we can do to, to um, subvert, I guess, uh, the expectations of, of stakeholders. I mean, we do we do have a board, but um, I'm. Uh, I mean, I think if if you go into the front of the of the gallery now, there's a, a, a Tony Albert work called uh, Misunderstanding, which has a, a stick of dynamite with Rio Tinto written on it, stenciled straight over the top of an Indigenous woman, which was hung at the gallery uh, the same day that Rio Tinto's board meeting happened here in the States. So we're going to continue to to work with artists to allow them to make statements like that in a timely way and um, uh, we haven't gotten in trouble so far. So, I think we need to get more, in more trouble generally would be my call. Um, does anyone else have a question? Um, so, uh, again, to um, the three of you working at institutions, you've all spoken a lot about the curation and the artists being represented, which is great that you're trying to diversify, but what are your organisations doing in, t in terms of reaching out to communities who don't traditionally come into those spaces and how are you opening up those spaces and making them feel welcome? Uh, in the uh, in the festival space, we so we have um, so Ellie Murray Young works as a dedicated community engagement um, coordinator, uh, and outside of the visual arts uh, and in, in inside the the core program, there's a we have a partner schools program bringing in um, bringing into uh, schools from lower socioeconomic backgrounds into conversation with the festival um, and bringing uh, festival artists to into them de uh, delivering delivering programs. There's a um, the community engagement really covers uh, um, a, a, a huge portfolio. And it's pro it's something that um, yeah it 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 it's difficult to sort of to, to summarize. Um, there's things like so there's discount tickets. There's uh, there's engagement workshops, professional development. Um, there's a, a full kind of it's called the Connect program um, that operates I suppose on a second on a second tier sort of um, around the festival and around every show the festival presents um, to look at if there is a community represented inside that uh, that um, that show or exhibition how to speak directly to that community to make sure that they feel welcome and are able to attend um there's uh it's certainly something that i think there's incredible room for for improvement um in but there there is um and in, in also I, I think in terms of, of of diversifying the team uh allows some of those conversations to to, to happen so it's a really sort of two-pronged approach but it is yeah it's something that we do we do think think about um, at Pika, we've got a wonderful engagement programs curator, Ashley Chan, and, and her role is to work alongside our 
uh, producer of our performance program and our curator to identify key moments for um, opportunities for the community to be connected with artists that we're working with. Um, so there's a beautiful exhibition that just opened on the weekend, Forest of Voices by Olga Saronis, and that had a really lengthy um, uh, engagement process with um, community members who had travelled to Australia by various means from um, diverse backgrounds and their voices are now represented in, in the West End Gallery upstairs, which is really beautiful. And I think um, a lot of the stuff that we do is very deliberate to, um, uh, you know, in line with our program, once that's determined, sort of uh, identify key community groups to, to connect with, that we know can do be done in a way that will leave a positive legacy and not just be in and out like a FIFO model or something like that. So we we, we tend to try and do things in a long-term um, reciprocal, we, reciprocity is a really big um, central part of the um, the way that we engage with community. We're also, we're going through a bit of a process to understand what we mean when we say community, because I think that, that that's something that we don't, Very, yeah. that we don't often inter interrogate in, in enough in enough detail and who is determining that definition of, of, of community is it us as an organization who uh, who not just who are these communities but what do we what do we mean um, what do we mean by that and so it's a, it's a series of workshops a series of discussions looking at things like our, our like our reconciliation action plan and our and 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 all of the sort of strategic documents around uh, that sit around the festival as well to make sure that we know very specifically what we're trying to do when we start to talk about things like community engagement because I think often that can be a very blurry space and that can cause some that can result in bad bad practice yeah I, I think uh, at Agua this is a, a big question for us we're going through a very um, a large sort of uh, rebranding process as well and a, a process of actually interrogating how we are communicating out how we're being perceived as well and how we go out to people um, largely we have um, we we largely we need to have more people attending the gallery and coming into the gallery overall as well. But in terms of its outreach um, within education programs, the Lily Blues he does fantastic work, bring out people in an engagement team that work uh, very hard to reach out to uh, schools groups within the education with the families and learning sector of things doing really fantastic work. But uh, I'll be the first to admit that within curatorial and programming and audience, we've got a long way to go, uh, especially in terms of. Uh, how we decide to communicate going forward as a gallery, as the rooftop opens, as we move into this new stage in the gallery as well. So that's something we're um, really interrogating as an organisation. I think it's probably time to wrap up. Rowan, do you have any final words you'd like to share? Um, not really. I think we've covered everything pretty well. Um, just, yeah, um, stop being colonial minded, I suppose. <laughs> stop being colonial minded. But um, I would, um, I guess, you know, in closing, just sort of thank the panel and go back to something you said right at the beginning is, you know, we've got such, disruption is such an opportunity. It, disruption is not a threat. It's not something, you know, we have to do. Here we are on this beautiful land on Noongar Buja, The You know, we have the oldest, like, continuous culture in the whole world. We've got migrants from all over the world. You know, we weren't white going back. We're not going to be white going forward. Um, we've got the opportunity here in the global south. You know, we've got incredible civic institutions to lead the world and create something really new if we listen more, I think. Um, you know, we don't always need to speak and assert. We just need time and space to listen and to reimagine. Um, this is a journey, I think, that will be positive for everybody. I don't think decolonization is an attack on anyone. It's it's a place and a space for us all to come together, you know, in a more human and connected way. Um, and I really enjoyed the conversations we've been having this week. So um, from a personal point of view, thank you, and I'd love them to continue. Yeah, and thank you, Shanine. Awesome, thank you. And I'd like to thank you. <laughs>